Well, hello, Mr. Willie. Yeah, happy BS Friday, Jennifer Cooper. Happy BS Friday, where BS today stands for big surprise, because guess what? You got me and not Dave. <laughs> It's a great surprise. It's always nice to uh, to to join the screen, to join the microphone, and to join the audience. Uh, you picked out a great topic, by the way. Hey, listen, who doesn't want to stop saying goodbye to their money? <laughs> I saw the image pop on social media last night. I'm like, that's a darn good image. So if we have newcomers, uh, we hope you enjoyed that image because the image is just a kickoff. To what we're going to talk about. Absolutely, absolutely. So with that, Mark, let's bring into bring into the show our guest today. Welcome, Charles. Hello there. Nice to join you. Awesome to have you. It's it's been a while in the making. Yes, it has. It has what a, over a year, I think. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Beautiful well, thing. Well, well, good things come to those who wait, as they say, right? That's right. Excellent. So before we hop into our topic today, why don't you give us a little bit of a background, tell us who you are, where you're from, what you're doing, and how you promise to stop our leaky houses from losing money. How we're going to change the world. So um, I grew up in North Carolina, and uh, my father was a uh, Mr. Fix-It. He could do anything. And I learned a lot from him. He was an amateur woodworker, and I started building furniture when I was still in grade school. Um, with that said, I went to university and got a degree in applied physics. Um, I was never a fan of math, but I was actually pretty good at, good at it. Um, and after the physics degree, I went to work in the tech industry. Um, I was at one point a uh, project manager for IBM's very first ThinkPad laptop computer back in the early 90s. I ended up in Silicon Valley. Um, I ran operations for an international company. We grew from zero revenue to over 500 billion revenue pretty quickly, doing hardware, um, going mostly. Um, I was running operations in Asia, um, Silicon Fab operations. So. The, um, there are not a lot of women in Silicon Valley, um, you know, so I had been a, um, I'd been uh, friends with people still back in North Carolina, and a friend of mine was um, getting the separation, and we started dating, and I moved back to North Carolina, and here I am. And so we moved into a high-end development, and the developer said, hey, Charles, you're a tech guy. Um, you ought to look into this new housing technology. Why not, right? Um, called structural insulated panels. Bam. Right? Um, he said, we're going to build the greenest um, development on the East Coast. And they were working with Darden Partners, which is a brownfield restoration hedge fund. Um, and they said, you bring a factory to Asheville, we'll give you 200 homes. Um, so what could go wrong <laughs> other than this was 2006? Yeah, perfect timing, Charles. <laughs> right? Hindsight is clear as mud. So I had, by 2007, a wonderful neighbor of mine, Ed Anderson, um, and I, um, we located, we searched the world over, as um, the, the old song says, and um, we, we found what we thought was pretty damn good technology about two hours away from where I lived in Asheville. Um, damn good technology, actually. And they were doing a smattering of a bunch of different things from disaster, uh, disaster recovery vehicles to refrigeration units to houses. And so I said, um, you know, why don't we partner with you? And he said, I'm turning 60. Uh, five, you know, I've got some other things going on. Why don't I sell you the operation? 2007. So by late 2007, we were the proud owners of a business that was doing a little bit of everything. And less than a year later, <laughs> that um, the developer in Asheville was bankrupt. And um, 
we had no customers and you know so i am gifted i say with add and i had to spend my time and innovate um and so we as we tried to grow the business from nothing um you know we've we've innovated along the way in 2021 we were the most awarded building products company on the planet um we've got a lot of neat things going on we are in all hemispheres on all continents um and we're i'm very excited to be here today excellent well we're super excited to have you and that's quite a journey i mean that is is quite the journey again from going from one industry into another in in a time where <laughs> wasn't uh the best of times to say Crazy the least time. yeah and what so what is really cool is that the applied physics that I learned in, in college, um, got a degree in, I'm using it more now than I ever did in the math world or in the, in the technology world. I, I love your transition. Like when you were going through the story of the depth of your experience and, and, and the file cabinets in your brain, when you said um, the ThinkPad, because a lot of us had them and, uh, you With know, the red dot, it, like it, it, it's iconic and they're certainly a different size and weight than some of the devices of today, right? But yeah. I immediately thought of ThinkSick. Right. Like right, right away, the world needed that as well. So for you to, to use both sides of your head and that ingenuity and say, I see what this is. I see what the market has I made mean, structural insulated panels uh, in some regards are still a rarity in in some folks. And uh, I think it's brilliant that you added that tech side to it. Wonderful. Thank you. We are really trying to bring technology to the construction industry. It is largely unchanged, as you know, from I think the 1720s. Um, they were documenting the first cases of building stud frame homes in America. The U.S. military was still using flintlock rifles, muzzle loading rifles in the, um, or excuse me, I said 1720s. I meant to say 1820s. In the 1820s, the, the U.S. military was still using muzzle-loading rifles. I mean, you know, so we are, we are today, people can drive around in, a, in an electric car. That's, it's the latest, greatest. They're booking their, their dinner reservations on their phone, and they're coming home to a house that's made with 200-year-old technology. It is, it, I mean, it is amazing how far we've come and yet how far we have to go. So, um, you know, when you talk about SIPs, you know, and the technology behind it, I mean, it's not even a hashtag. Like it's it's not even a searchable term. Like it, it, people are still so far from understanding, you know, how those structural insulated panels really can deliver on performance. So uh, let, let me, let me, um... One one word I cringe about is SIPs. You Go on. Great. That word Tell on us about website. that. If, if you find the word on our website, it's talking about the competition. Got um, it. So let me let me explain that. And Mark, you 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 hit it when you said, "Hey, they really haven't taken off." Um, so when you were a kid, if your dad ever took you fishing. Maybe when you were really young and y'all were just trying to figure it out, you might have seen him buy a polystyrene or styrofoam cooler and you put it in the back of the car and it might have lasted one or two trips before it started to fall apart. It was a big box of worms. Yeah. And <laughs> we did those too. Um, so as you got older, you got a little bit wiser. Maybe you had more money in your pocket and you graduated to maybe a Coleman cooler or an Igloo cooler. And today you're paying $500 for a Yeti cooler. Um, listen, kudos to those guys for reinventing the cooler. But the predominant 
panel, 90 plus percent of the structural insulated panels or SIPs sold on the market today are expanded polystyrene. Um, they're EPS or styrofoam panels. We use a closed cell urethane foam. So the, the cooler that you had as a child that fell apart quickly or melted if it ever got near the fire, um, that is the polystyrene SIPs. Um, the Foam insulation in a, I appreciate that you like that, Mark. Um, the, the foam insulation in a Yeti cooler is made with the same foam insulation that we use in our panels. So essentially, we want a home to be like a Yeti cooler. Um, some building scientists out there talk about you should build a home like a walk-in cooler. Um, I've been using that analogy for a while because the the operation that we bought actually used to build those. Um, and we still build them for, um, for companies now and then. But the, um, the predominant focus of our product today, look, we want to reduce the complexity on a job site. Um, when I was in the high tech industry, uh, we were tracking defects in manufacturing of silicon wafers in the parts per million ppm. Um, we Malcolm Bardridge Quality Award. Um, you know, we talked about opportunities for error. That's OFE. And an opportunity for error is one thing that can go wrong in an assembly. And when you identify all the things that go go wrong and then track them against the actual things that do go wrong, um, you start to understand the quality levels. How many job sites out there today are tracking OFEs or PPM? Well, thankfully, everyone that I know uh, <laughs> is accurate. In fact, they don't even know need tape measures, right? Looks good right, for more right. house, right? Tol tolerances are a thing. And, and to your point on the, on the first part, not all insulation is the same. They all have different qualities. They all have different makeups and variances in thicknesses and durability and how the environment affects it is a deep, deep subject. So I'm glad that it's a big SIP, deal. I'm glad that SIP is a is a, is a trigger for you. What's not a trigger for me is eco. So with so do you want me to talk about that? Or? Yeah, let's let's, let's, I, let's get into the product. Let's let's yep. take a look and really and and talk about this because you know, Mark, you know, I mean, you give great food analogies all the time, Mark. And the best pizza starts with good dough, <laughs> right? So let's 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 get into the the good ingredients here. So uh, we're are we going to do this with visuals? By the way, are y'all seeing my screen? Let's put it up momentarily because this is this is really important. This is the this is the guts. And as as this sets up, I want I want to give Charles a quick laugh here. Uh, I gave a presentation on panelization last week to a crowd of construction professionals, engineers and architects. Eight minutes into the presentation, I noticed the person in front of me was befuddled like they were in the wrong room. And so I stopped. <laughs> And I said, I'm, I apologize. I see where you're at. Is there, is there a part you want me to back, back up to? Now, granted, the name of the presentation was panelization. And the gentleman's question was, what is panelization? Wow. So I, I realized that I misspoke, right? And I didn't meet the audience where they were. And right. this is why today is important, because all of us get to meet you where you are so we can catch our butts up you know you're so right um and we all are guilty of this right we we live in our own little world and we know everything that we know and we generally assume that other people do too and we we often start from a higher level than what someone's expecting so can you see the video that is running now we are. We're looking at it. Um, so this is our website homepage. And I had produced this video a while back um, 
to to really show people how panelization can work on a job site. Um, that is our closed cell phone with the torch on it. That's a unique single piece corner panel. Um, we're sealing the joints before we close the panels together with an embedded cam lock. Um, this crew is a trained crew because we've been working with them for years, but um, we've had Boy Scouts put together our panels. We've had high school classes put together our panels and they are building homes that are more energy efficient than um, most any builder can erect. Um, and so the panels, somebody gives us a plan. We basically break down that plan into panels, into rectangles, and we um, design the rectangles to be structural. Um, our panels are inherently structural in that we're, in, we're building a hollow cavity in our factory and we are injecting inside of a large press that panel with closed cell urethane foam. It expands with great pressure, um, but yet when it cures out, it produces a panel that is two or three times stronger than any stud frame wall. Um, and it goes together with lower skilled labor with much greater um, energy efficiency. You can see there that single piece corner panel, that's the only product of its type on the market. Uh, we are continuously insulating at the corner we're all stud framed homes, um, do not um, have the opportunity to entirely insulate at the corner because you have studs there. Yep, it's usually the shortcoming of the space. You have the, the wall the, and window area capturing and this effective R value and you move into the corner and it's just dark purple. Right, and this is um, thermal efficiency. I'm scrolling down, um, these are um let's call them well they call them green belt homes um these are near where i live um there's precast uh maze or precast concrete wall solutions um often below these homes okay and then two by six stud frame with spray foam in the wall cavities um and this is what these homes look like so these are green homes as they market um, I don't know if you can follow my cursor in this image here. You can see this bright white line here on well, this thermal image. That Charles, is the, the reason this is out here. So after the building is finished, uh, people could do a takeoff for how many studs they needed to build the next <laughs> one, right? Right. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you can see, you can almost see people moving inside the home, right? It's leaking so much energy. And this is money out of these people's pockets. So just, you know, as a comparison, Charles, I mean, for the people who aren't, thank you for scrolling up there. So as a comparison, as you scroll down and you see more purple and less orange, that's that's more of what we're looking for. So for so this is what you're looking for. This is what you want. Um, and these images were taken on the same two nights that these images were and in one can one place two of these images were across the street from one of these images so, so i'm literally turning around in the road and it was in a new development it was i'm literally turning around the road taking a photo thermal image of one of our homes and then um yeah two of these so, it's so, so it yeah, Go it's ahead. so interesting because even, you know, going back to our days of building homes, clients would often ask, you know, how efficient are my windows? How efficient are my doors? I don't think I ever received one question about walls. Right. Is that it? Uh, Generally, builders are trying to build the home that the client wants. The client focuses on kitchens and bathrooms and the appearance and, you know, the builder, quite frankly, they say, okay, well, they want this. It's going to cost that much. How much is left in the budget? And so they build the envelope out of the cheapest materials that they, they can. This is the reference we always come back to is, uh, you know, I always give the made-up aunt and the made-up uncle that we had furniture placed in a room strategically away from the walls because we weren't comfortable. Right. And this technology in front of us allows us to visually see what 
poor thermal management is all about and the effectiveness of the wall is diminished and the continuity of that insulation is not delivered right and one of the one of the other things that's really starting to come to the forefront of the table is the strength of the home um we just did structural testing of a eco panels corner panel with a stud frame wall and the mere presence of it, one of our corner panels in a stud, otherwise stud frame home assembly increased the strength of that wall by almost 300%. Um, what happens when you are creating a structural insulated panel is you're significantly increasing the shear capacity of that wall. And shear capacity comes into play whenever a high wind event um, comes into play. And as we say with see with changing weather patterns um, today, those are increasingly frequent. Absolutely. And when you talk about the structural strength, I mean, if we if we think back to those visuals of, of the people lifting the panels and installing them, I mean, how heavy are these these panels? It didn't seem like you were using any type of mechanical lifts or extra strong people um, to get these things up and, and put together. So we've designed our product where it could be assembled by um, people with no extra equipment. Um, my dream client is somebody that's um, building a home for themselves because they can't afford a builder. Every year we have clients build homes for around $100 a square foot. Um, they're, built, they're acting as owner builders. These panels, the four and a half inch panels are rated at R26. That's more than twice the effect of our value of the standard um, wood frame wall in, in, in this country. Um, that, that is four, at four pounds a square foot, that's around 125 pounds per panel average panel um yes, so two guys can easily lift it the six and a half inch panels are um are 40 rated and um they do even though they're just about 20 or 30 pounds heavier per panel um they do seem to take longer for the assembly just because they're a little bit more cumbersome there's a movie out called home alone if we could capture that image of the technical part and the weight you just gave it would be <laughs> like uh, perfect I, I can't believe that weight but again that is a deliverable so de de besides the attributes of the finish space the constructability portion and that weight ratio because not all sites allow for uh a crane heavy equipment. And heavy, what's that they don't allow for heavy equipment Right. There, there's not there's a spatial concern, maybe because of landscape, maybe because of bridges along the way, maybe because it's an infill lot. And and this is where it's at. So if you don't have that equipment on site and you have Jane and, and Jill and Bob and Tim. Right. Well, there it is. I mean, this is a barn raising to a whole new level. There's uh, we do bag. those, too. <laughs> So where, where I want us to be as a community is let's, let's push this old building technology aside. Let's reduce the skill required on a job site to build a better home. It all comes down first to the building envelope, second to the materials. And when you use better materials, um, then it comes down to the method of assembly and can you assemble with lower opportunities for error? Here's a fun fact. Did you know for every single nail, there are five opportunities for error in driving that nail? So there might be 50,000 nails in a given home. You're at a quarter of a million opportunities for error just related to nailing. You have met different carpenters than I have because I have never met a carpenter that makes a mistake. <laughs> and I'm one of them, right? I'm, right. I'm, so uh, let's delivering to community and those offerings uh, is certainly some of your strong suits. Can we dive into more of, of the innovation so people can get that depth of 
where you've been and where we can go. So where we've been, if I go back to our um, panel screen. No, I, I, I want to say, Charles, where we've been, the marketplace, and where you could take us. Okay, so where we've been, um, I actually give a college uh, lecture on this, um, going back to about 100,000 years. Is that good? Uh, <laughs> so back then, and if people think people lived miserably back then, right? They didn't. Um, there's wonderful examples um, of people using thermal mass to their advantage by living in caves. You know, the, the Seminole Indians in Florida raised their homes above the ground to live because they knew that the high humidity was down low. The Hopi Indians, the cliff dwellers in Arizona, lived where they did because they were leveraging, they were in harmony with the earth. And then we come along smarter, right? We know what we're doing. We're going to build a home and we're going to we're going to industrialize it and we're going to build stud frames and gosh, everybody can drive a nail and we can all put our homes together. And, um, you know, that happened for 150 years or so, you know, insulation as we know it today did not even exist on a large scale in the 1950s in the United States. And we had it, we, we had it in fact, a recent adventure. Yeah, we had a very, very large heating systems that were so powerful that they basically <laughs> pushed heat through the outside walls. So we didn't have an issue with when drying. Yep. Right. So I love Homes how you're were bridging. Well ventilated back then, and it wasn't intentional. <laughs> so you're bridging the gap between anthology and building science, which is incredible, right? If only we went back in time and studied how people actually lived because they were paying attention to their surroundings and using as little as possible to be as comfortable as possible. Yes. Can, you sh can you show us some of the tech that's in the panels? Can you, can you maybe bring up some uh, um, from your website? Sure. So the single back to our website, the single piece corner panels, um, this imagine if you're walking down a steep slope, um, your your foot is turned to the side. It's not stuck out in front of you, but yet in a traditional stud frame wall that that is acting as if your foot was stuck out in front of you going down a steep slope. So when That's the sidewalls are in sheer. Yep. The forces, those shear forces actually round the corner with our single piece corner panel. Um, also, of course, we're insulating through it like no one else can. So I say that we have the most efficiently insulated homes on the planet. Would you believe this, um, Mark? I don't know. I don't know if you know this. Um, you tr you travel around quite a bit, but did you know that there is no standard for how to build a stud frame corner. There's no, in law, there's no requirement how to build that corner, how to bring two walls together. And yet that's one of the weakest parts of a home. Yeah, there's, there's uh, the closest thing you'll get to it is the introduction. Uh, and I know you're going to giggle. I'm going to say it anyway. I, I'm good at embarrassing and putting my foot in my mouth. Uh, there's advanced framing. There's California corners, and uh, our friend Stephen Basic ushered in the Missouri corner, right? And but in the world of carpentry, when you get your framing book, uh, usually the depth of how far that goes is the wall area yeah. of 16 or some profound number like 24, goodness me, uh, inches on center, and yes. The only time the corner is addressed is if there's a, a, a tie down or a shear point that an engineer has called from the structural side, uh, but that has nothing to do with thermal management, right? And That's this, this is making homes weaker as we go to California corners. And we've actually shown that in testing. I don't think with the changing, you know, we're conflicted, right? So we were actually using thermal mass 
to keep ourselves comfortable 100,000 yep. years ago. And then we said, oh, well, let's build a structure. And then for 150 years, we were framing structures. We weren't worried about insulation. And then we said, oh, maybe we better start adding insulation as we started demanding higher levels of comfort. We started, we're, we're building this Rube Goldberg machine we're, we're making this really complicated, oh, if you do it this way and that way, how many people do you know that are actually advanced framing? Um, you know, not many, even the green builders out there said, oh, we're not doing that anymore. Um, you know, so we've made it more complicated. Let's make it more simple with a better product. Yeah. And not only that, when you're building that better product, you know, you're creating a home that's more durable, it's more resilient. And unfortunately, in the world that we're in, it actually, it serves to save lives. So, exactly. so you're not me, just saving you money. Something that we invented. Um, this is our new product, the Epic Block. Um, there it is. And, and, you know, my apologies to the carpenters out there that want to build everything out of wood. I get that, but um, we salute you with the middle image on the right with the, uh, the, uh, the wooden sided epic block. It's really pretty. Um, but this is a product that uses our same closed cell urethane foam. Um, this is an R40 rated concrete block that requires no mortar, no rebar, we're using simple construction adhesive and threaded rod or steel cable to get the wall in a compression fit with oh. a top plate. And you see right here, this wall is taking a 30,000 pound load. It's actually flexing more than four inches. And so that's like, a, break. that's like a PL uh, uh, adhesive or... I don't want to be brand specific, but I'm close, curious. It is a urethane adhesive. It is a construction um, adhesive that you yeah. buy at Lowe's or Walmart or Home Depot. It is not high dollar components. And we're actually working with double-sided, evaluating double-sided tapes now because it makes it easier. Okay. So I'm uh, just curious. I mean, is this an option for or retrofit as well. Like when we're thinking about, you know, homes and buildings that need to be rehabilitated, is this an option for that also? Absolutely. The, the intended audience, so I, having lived in California, Northern California, I first, uh, you know, my, my inspiration was my friends that were affected by the fires. And I wanted to, I didn't think, hey, bring a wooden panel to California to um, help rebuild the forest fires. I didn't think I'd make it very far. Um, so I said, how could I bring them a fire resistant product? And so by using different thickness concrete skins on our block, we can have a different level of fire rating for the block that anyone could then assemble. You're not going to, you know, after disaster, you can't find a builder. Um, those there weren't enough builders before the disaster. And so we are allowing people to rebuild their own homes on their own concrete slab. Okay, so this is above grade. It's it can be below grade or above oh. grade. We've done testing for both. And is there a treatment that we need for water or vapor or air? Um, or this? Absolutely. Um, okay. So one thing that's really cool is the latest uh, molds we've got, you actually almost feel a sucking sensation when you lift one block off the other because it's such a tight, um, it's really cool. Um, wow. I geek out on it, but it's such a tight fit. But um, on the outside of that uh, block wall, if it is below grade, treat it just like a masonry wall. Um, you know, you want to put a, uh, weather resistant barrier, some type of below grade uh, rated uh, barrier along the, just treat it just like a masonry wall. You treat it like a masonry wall, but the assembly is not as complex as being a trained mason. Or it is, is heavy. better than an ICF. It's the inverse of an ICF. 
So what about like modifications, future modifications, if a homeowner or, or a, you know, a building occupant wanted to make changes, can you, can you, you know, change where windows and doors are placed? So as with our panels, um, let me go back to the panels. Um, the main, the, so the block wall, yes, um, the, because we, we know how to do it with the panels and it's similar, um, similar uh, technologies. Um, because we're, we're, we've got a component, right? And uh, we've got a family of components when they join together to form a larger wall system. Um, and so absolutely, you know, most homes we do, somebody says, oh, I forgot an outlet. Um, you know, can I add an outlet here or there? Um, absolutely, you can. We show people how to do that. It often involves just a little circular saw and, um, and maybe a knife for cutting foam, um, but it's easily done. I can do it myself and I'm not a carpenter. So that shows you how easy. So how do you, how do um, your, how does your building product get called out, you know, on a plan? You know, are you, are people coming to you? You're designing their homes. Who's designing the homes? How does, how does that all work? Um, so believe it or not, 98% of our clients are people that approach us over our website. We do almost no advertising. They just hear about us through word of mouth or through web searches. They give us a plan that is simply the home that they want to build. Um, I kind of reject the whole, oh, panels only make modern homes. No, um, we help people build, you know, period homes, craftsman style homes, any home they want. Um, and so people bring us a plan, we convert that plan, and we give them then panels that are structurally sound for the plan that they're looking for. That's great. And is the roof panelized as well? How does, how does the roof system work? Um, roof panels go down much like sheathing on a roof. Um, you know, sometimes we don't recommend our roofs because if people are on a tight budget um, and they're going to have attic space, Listen, one of the best assemblies that we did figure out over the last 200 years is that a vented attic actually does a pretty good job if you insulate on the floor of that attic and you don't have mechanicals in that attic. Um, and so about 70, 60 to 70 percent of our business is wall panels only. Um, people can you know, erect the wall panels. So most homes go up within around... Um, four to five hours, the, the walls of those homes go up and then they're set in trusses by the afternoon. Um, Fantastic. And, and I love that you, that you say that because sometimes people say, well, I have the answer for everything. And instead you're pointing to the fact that that answer is there. I don't need to solve that problem. Right. And, and not only that, I mean, Mark, you know, no one solution solves for every single problem. And more and more often we're seeing the hybrid approach, you know, where different building method methods come together and, and really um, create those custom solutions that a lot of homeowners are looking for. Um, what's exciting, and I know we're not going to talk about it today, but I do want to give props to your team is just the, also the good work that you're doing to um, work with developers, work with builders who are coming up with unique solutions to house homeless, you know, those experiencing homeless, to house veterans. You know, not only are you offering these solutions, you know, to the, to the masses, you're offering these solutions to people truly in need. You know, that's where my heart is. Um, I want to establish, we judge at an African immigrant. He doesn't even speak well English but he just built his home um, near our factory for less than $100 a square foot. Um, he took 18 months to do it. Um, hey, but now he's got generational equity that he can hand down. And that's, that's brilliant. That's where we want to be to enrich the lives of people we're working with for generations to come. I mean, sweat that's the American is, dream. Yeah. Sweat equity is beautiful too. I always say, all projects finished the, you know, the question is when, right? We've heard that, but the <laughs> fact that to sustain that commitment for those right. months shows you the type of character that this fine individual. Well, they included is. COVID months. So I think a lot of it was just waiting on other people. Yeah. No one could, no one could calculate COVID months. Not even the think right. pad <laughs> can calculate that. 
So I do want to go into some comments and questions. And, and when we wrap up the show, Charles, I do want to maybe give you the opportunity. A topic that, you know, lots of us are talking about right now is, um, you know, what's happening in Hawaii and the devastation that's happening there. So after we get through some comments and questions, would love to hear your thoughts on any advice or guidance that you would give to those talking about how we re re rebuild that space. Um, sure. You know, if, if you could talk directly to them, would, would love sure. to hear your thoughts. But first, let's uh, let's just give a couple of shout outs to people who are tuning in today. Gregory Leha, um, we have Brent Musson, we have Andrew Seely. Howdy, folks. It's the time of the week. Lots of that heat stuff here in Texas. And, and Texas is definitely a place that needs this type of solution. Uh, we have Greg. We're hoping to passively cool homes in South Texas. That's what it's all about. Um, so thank you for tuning in, Greg. Uh, we got the boss today joining Mark. Not, not quite. I think he's he's talking about Charles. See, he's making me choke. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Greg is Greg's wonderful for that. And I love your comment about Texas. We're going to have to circle back on that one. Really good timing there. Uh, here's what's interesting. If, if, you're, if you're not catching up with it, folks, many times people hear the word insulation and they say that's keeping me warm, right? Well, it is also keeping you cool. So heat moves, right, to cool. And so it's the same aspect. So when you ha hear this from Charles saying, this is our idea from Texas, you saw his other ideas. It's time to listen. And that's why this website is so important as a visual as we go through this, is it's a couple of clicks. You have all the options, and then do the right thing. Email, phone. Absolutely. Right. And we have Mr. Hershey saying, thank you for bringing echo panels to the masses. Um, and we do have a question from, from Dr. Musson here. I've always been an evangelist for LGS framing and volumetric manufacturing because of the low variance in component shape and dimensions. This conversation piques my interest in SIPs for volumetric. Am I ahead of the game or late to the party? So I think he's asking about using the panels within volumetric modular construction if more advanced manufacturing um, leveraged building products like this in their systems? I, I would say it's advantageous uh, because you're already handling many of the attributes. And when you think of the world of volumetric as, as stationary uh, groupings come up, the connectivity of them, of those panels, expand on that square footprint. So not only do you get the shell and, and the finalized spaces, but the expansionness of panels assist volumetric a great deal. Jennifer, am I sharing my screen again? We have it back up now. Here we are. So let's talk about volumetric. <laughs> and, and our four is <laughs> commencing. I love it. Right. Um, so this is uh, steel container frames with our panels as unfill. Um, so 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 is this is this the raw framing or is this uh when so steel framing for containers can well, either this, these are container frames before the panels container are frames okay. literal shipping container frames that um that are that have not had standard metal applied to the inside they so were before, ordered before the corrugation that yeah, that's what I'm saying, Charles. Before the corrugation was and uh, right. was added, this is the quasi structure, right? Because that corrugated added structure. But in your cases, your panels are assisting the the short end of the structure that these don't have. That's correct. Perfect. And this is the finished building. Those down there, um, it's in Georgia. It is a beautiful building. Um, and so it's a modular facility that can be broken down, packed up, and reset um, wherever this this client wanted to move their business. Wow. I mean, that's that's what's interesting about this. You know, you're you're talking about the circular economy now, and when you when you are designing these things to be repurposed for future use. 
um, avoiding, you know, all of those building materials going into the landfill. I mean, that is just one more of the inherent um, values of, of using building systems. So we had a Habitat home. We had panels in Chicago that were in as one structure, uh, actually a multi-award winner for the solar decathlon from Northwestern University. Those panels were broken down and erected in an entirely separate designed habitat home in uh, Bertha, Colorado. What, 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 what project, what year was that project, Charles? Um, 2017, 2018. Uh, I saw that. Uh, I saw that on the campus before they deployed it. There you I go. I didn't realize that was your panels. Those were our panels. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes people tell us, don't Charles, don't put your logo on stuff. <laughs> I, I was there as the show got finalized. Uh, oh, cool. and we're with our passive house team. Uh, helping them kind of get to the curve. I don't remember how they did in the competition, but yeah, then the project they won was two relocated. First place awards. Um, one, I believe, for customer um, the customer appreciation, and then one for cost efficiency. Beautiful. So one last question will flash up, then um, we'll move into any advice that you might have for people looking to real rebuild in, in scalable ways. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. But Dr. Musson asks, those pictures are exciting. Are you using the SIPs for interior partition walls or only bearing walls? We generally recommend against using um, the panels for interior partition walls because what you're doing then is creating more zones um, of insulated space inside the building. Um, and so we, we, you know, that can, can potentially stress the, um, the HVAC equipment. Um, and so generally there, there are sometimes reasons people want internal panels, but typically we're not doing that. Say, say you had an office, uh, a very loud child, right? Or it, a recording studio, I, those sort of aspects of sound attendant for the sound properties, not, you know, more on the acoustic side, I guess. You know, I tell people use fiberglass insulation because it's a lot better sound insulator than it is a thermal insulator. Wow, you heard it here, folks. So I said that was the last question, but just one more. I think it's a quick answer. How many panels can Charles produce in a month, asks Mr. Ugaldi. How big's the opportunity? So right now we've got a couple of factories. We have more in the works um, yet to be announced, but... Um, you know, we are working on typically three different jobs at a time and two to three of those ship out a week. Um, and so we're, but all jobs are different, right? Um, so along the Gulf Coast, um, the, the 36 housing units that we worked on, multifamily housing, um, those went through our factory in two weeks. Um, if that, so, you know, it all depends on the side, the, the, the high end homes that I kid you not have more than 40 corners in the home. Um, they're really complex. Um, those take a while in the factory, small, simple homes move really fast, you know, within a day or two, we're done with them. At, at the end of the day though, if it takes a little bit more time in the factory, it doesn't matter because it takes no time in the field. Right. Excellent. So one last time, let's just let everybody know where they can find out more information, www.echo-panels.com. Um, and definitely follow Charles for more information around the amazing projects that they're working on. Um, but what do you think, Charles? What would you tell people who are looking to rebuild um, in, in, you know, climate disaster areas or, you know, places that have been devastated by wildfires, that sort so of we've, thing? We've done this before. We've rebuilt homes after fires, after tornadoes, after hurricanes. Um, we've, we've got documented jobs for all of them. Um, 
what I would tell them is, unfortunately, they're not going to find a builder. Um, they're, they're not. Um, so modular is a path to reconstruction without finding a local builder. And so if they reach out to a modular company, you know, find something you like online. Obviously, we would like their business, but what modular offers this client is the opportunity to rebuild that home without using the local labor because I'm sorry, people, that local labor is not available. Builders were in tight supply before this disaster happened. Um, and so, um, you know, find somebody that is already doing this and they're already bringing in structures or panels. And um, that is a way that hopefully um, you can start to rebuild. One vision that we have is, you know, instead of setting modular in a field five miles out of town and moving the community there, why can't we um, clean off that floor platform um, of the home that was burned down or burned up and let's rebuild on that site. And um, we have taken photos of old homes and created panel plans from those photos and shipped those panels for clients. Hell, a third of our, a third of our clients come in with um, paper drawings, um, you know, pencil sketches on graph paper, and we are producing panel plans from that. So there are opportunities. You just have to think outside the box. I'm sorry, builders, but don't go to the local builder. Um, look for a modular um, opportunity that services in your area. Well, we appreciate that. And I know all the people out there who are looking for guidance will hopefully um, take it into consideration. And it's truly been a pleasure to have you today, Charles. Thank you for sharing your story. Listen, Jennifer and Mark, um, I really enjoyed it. Excellent. Excellent. So just real quick, everybody, Dave will be back on Monday where we're, we're talking about how to finance modular construction. Oftentimes people are curious, how do you finance, um, you know, offsite construction? How does it differ from traditional construction? Well, this Monday, get all your answers, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And with that, Charles, stay right where you are. We'll come back to you. And Mark, we'll see you next Friday.